thank you very much. Nice to be here. And uh, I, I note that uh, in the front row is John Depre, whose uh, father, Emile Depre, was the intellectual and uh, moral uh, godfather of the CDE. And so we're delighted to have you here, John, to celebrate this occasion. Uh, <clears throat> as the chairman said, I'm going to focus on the process of policy making to pick up from Toga. How do we decide which apples to pick, and uh, how do we decide which ones to polish and how to polish them? In the 25th anniversary program uh, at the CDE in 1985, Henry Bruton, who was, I think I'm the first person who's mentioned Henry today, a little bit yes yesterday, everybody mentioned Henry, so <laughs> you must feel neglected today, Henry. Uh, Henry and Paul Clark did a piece on policy making, and they had a uh, a very arresting proposition in there, I thought, which is there's no such thing as good policy that can be separated from the process by which it is made. And so that's my, that's my theme here. Uh, and I, in my experience in a number of different countries, a number of different situations, it, it, it has seemed to me that the best policy processes, which also led to very good policies, uh, involved a close working relationship between uh, political leaders who had the ultimate decision-making authority and the people who were advising them on the technical matters, whether it was economists or geologists or biologists or botanists or agronomists or MDs or whatever it is. And that close relationship so that the politicians understand what the technicians are saying about the reality on the ground and the technicians understand the constraints and the objectives that the, that the politicians have, and they have an actual real conversation and exchange about that, that seems to me to, to uh, produce good results. And if we get time, I'll give you an, ex an example of what I think was a good POS process and another which was uh, not so good. Um, the emphasis yesterday on asking questions, uh, and uh, Anna mentioned this afternoon, keeping thinking. Uh, uh, the issue of what are the facts on the ground uh, against which decision making must take place is extremely important. Toga mentioned this and, and others have as well. Um, and I, I have a simplistic approach to things, but this woman who's my dean at, at Carleton for 13 years, she used to say occasionally, apparently what goes without saying doesn't go without saying. <laughs> so. Uh, so what is the process? It seems to me that the process is going, looking, and this is both the politicians and the technicians, looking at the options and the trade-offs that are, that, are uh, that are available so that people understand what choices they are making, uh, including a choice to not do anything. That's a choice, after all. What choices are, they, are being made? And what are the political and economic and social constraints and objectives against which these, these choices are being made? So in a sense, it's a very simple proposition. Executing it, I, I think, is a very difficult thing. I think there are, my observation, there are many reasons for what we would all call bad policies. Sometimes it's poor analysis. Sometimes it's laziness on the part of the the civil servants who are supposed to be doing the analysis, sometimes it's corruption, sometimes it's ideology. We heard a couple of examples of that yesterday. Um, sometimes it's a lack of uh, consultation and uh, discussion. And as to give you an example, uh, I'll, I'll spell it out if you want later, that even a policy choice that results in a terribly corrupt system may have been made that choice may have been made on the basis of an ideological preference for something like import licensing that had nothing to do in the minds of the people making that choice with the potential for corruption. Uh, it seems to me that there are two requirements for, uh, for good policy making. One is uh, a need to assess the costs and the benefits of alternatives, knowing the facts, understanding that there are many ways of skinning a cat or, or of achieving objective, and then a way of assessing and evaluating the costs uh, or the benefits of those things. What, what, are the, what, are the, what are the results? What are the, what are the things we're trying to achieve? And again, this is easy to state, and in my experience, very difficult to do. And as I say, it requires the, uh, the cooperation between economists and politicians. 
I think that the dichotomy which one often hears about, and I used to hear it from civil servants and economists in different countries, and they say, well, we knew what the right thing to do, but the politicians wouldn't let us do it. <laughs> or the complaint that was mentioned several times yesterday, no matter how many economists you lay end to end, they can't reach a conclusion. Uh, when you have politicians and economists blaming each other for not doing the right thing, that seems to me to be a, simply a, a demonstration that the policy-making process has not worked, that they were not listening to each other, they were not on the same page. Um, one of the things that I always enjoyed about teaching at the CDE when I was here was the, the comparative experience. In one year, it's class of 73, two of the brightest students in the class were Mr. Ng from Singapore and Sam Monsi from Lesotho. I defy you to find a generalization about economic policy or economic development that applies to all countries including Lesotho and Singapore. And anytime somebody would make a generalization and say the nature of policy is such and such, one or the other would put his hand up and say, well, that doesn't apply here because, and he would lay out the facts on the ground. Now, I think that, that this emphasis on inquiry, on continual analysis, on understanding the facts that are different in different countries and may be different this year from what they were three years ago in the same country are extremely important. The, example, the best example I can think of in, in, uh, in relation particularly to the, the Washington consensus issue it happened about more than almost 30 years ago in Botswana, when the end of the diamond and mineral boom in the late 1970s, uh, commodity prices peaked in the 1980s, it was a collapse in 1981-82, and Botswana took a huge hit. Um, they had been anticipating this for five years and had been building up foreign exchange reserves for five years. The IMF made a visit and they said, well, the fact that you've got 18 months of reserves really doesn't make any difference. You must reduce your budget deficit to this, you must do this, that, and the other thing. And uh, the government said, thank you very much. We'll see you in Washington. And they put together their own set of uh, policy adjustments. And it was worked out, again, in sort of consultation with the technicians and the politicians, and they worked out it was a very tough adjustment process, but it was done very quickly. The, uh, not only was the cabinet on board, but the entire parliament was briefed on the analysis and PS. It helped that five years, starting five years earlier, there had been regular briefings of the cabinet and parliament on macroeconomic policy, adjustment issues, the role of the exchange rate, how monetary policy worked, and so on and so forth. So that by the time a crisis hit, there was an understanding, nobody liked it, but there was an understanding of why this was an issue and what had to be done. And as a result, within about nine to 12 months, this extremely difficult economic situation had been turned around and they were back on their trend line of expansion of uh, uh, development spending and so on. So that's just one example, Mr. Chairman. I will, uh, I will cease here and let you go to questions. Thank you, Steve. I was beginning to worry that I would. Yeah.